Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final week of our webinar series, Remote Sensing of Forest Cover and Change Assessment for Carbon Monitoring. My name is Amber McCollum, and I'll be your instructor today, along with two of our guest speakers, Carly Green from the Global Forest Observations Initiative, and Henrik Fliefit from the Royal Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment. Both Carly and Henrik's presentations have been pre-recorded for this final session. Um, since they are located in some time zones that didn't quite work for us this morning. So this is our last week, week five, and we will be primarily talking about guidance, reporting, and verification. First, we will hear from Carly Green. I wanted to just let you all know ahead of time that both of these uh, guest speakers are pre-recorded, and they both went a little long in their presentations. So this session might go a little long. Um, it might go past our allotted time, or hour and a half. So if you're unable to stay for the, for the entire session, um, I encourage you to watch the recording online. That will be available. And um, I also encourage you to type in your questions into the chat throughout the session as we won't be able to answer any questions at the end. Um, so just a heads up there that the session might be a little long, um, but I, I guarantee you it's useful um, information for you. So first we'll be hearing, hearing from Carly Green, and she will be primarily talking about the methods and guidance documents, um, and also some UNFCCC reporting requirements, and the Red Compass tool, which is a very useful online tool. Then we will um, hear from Henrik Fleefit, and he is going to talk to you about how to make Red Plus operational, how to conduct some verification, and talk a little bit about the carbon market system. So if you'll just bear with me here, I um, will switch out and play our first recording. Um, I also want to let you all know if you're having connection issues or the sound is cutting out, I first recommend that you um, leave the room and come back in, and if you continue to have issues, everything will be available online. And so long as you're here for um, even a few minutes during our presentation today, your attendance will be counted. So feel free to view the recordings online afterwards if you're having um, issues here. So I will stop sharing this, and I will go ahead and play Carly's presentation for you all here. Thanks, Amber. Uh, good morning or oh, good afternoon, um, whatever time zone you're in, everybody. Um, my name is Carly Green. I'm the Methods and Component Manager for the Global Forest Observations Initiative. I'm very pleased to be here uh, today to give a presentation on um, methods and guidance for Red Plus, and in particular for those countries who voluntarily uh, opt to report their Red Plus emissions and removals, I'm going to focus in on, on the measurement, reporting and verification requirements. So just by way of background um, and, and uh, summary, so the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change adopted uh, Red Plus as a work program on results-based finance um, to progress and fully implement the activities to reduce emissions and um, I'm sorry, to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, and also uh, to encourage the sustainable forest management and uh, enhancement of carbon stocks in developing countries. And this program is commonly known as Red Plus. Uh, Red Plus has been in the UNFCCC negotiation framework uh, since around 2008, and um, over the course of um, the last uh, few years, has been adopted through a series of decisions. Um, and most commonly, or most recently, the two um, COPs, the Conference of the Parties, uh, Warsaw and Paris, um, finalised the majority of the decisions and the framework for Red Plus MRV. So the Red Plus measurement, reporting and verification requirements are for countries that voluntarily um, choose to report their Red Plus emissions and removals. And of course, if that for those countries who do voluntarily um, uh, choose to report, those um, emissions and removals reported need to be monitored and um, in a robust framework. 
the UNFCCC through those decisions has um, specified that countries need to use the most recent IPCC, which is the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, they have a series of guidance documents and countries who choose to report REDD+ must um, use those documents as the basis for their uh, the estimation of their emissions and removals associated with Red Plus activities. They also specify that those um, uh, estimates need to be based on a series of remote sensing and ground-based data and these um, two sources of data need to be used in combination when estimating emissions and removals. Global Forest Observations Initiative identifies um, the, the methods and guidance and uh, the procedures for using remote sensing and ground-based data in combination um, need to more support around the, the use of those data sources needs to be provided for Red Plus countries. And the GFOI is an initiative that looks at four core components for to support Red countries in their MRV um, requirements. So the first one is um, the development of methods and guidance that focuses specifically on Red Plus MRV requirements specified by the UNFCCC. The second element of the Global Forest Observations Initiative is um, the work with space agencies to coordinate data supply for developing countries reporting Red Plus. Thirdly, the GFOI works in a range of countries and through a range of different organisations in building capacity um, and that's through agency and country engagement. And f finally, we also work in coordinating research and development specifically for Red Plus countries. So working through some of the needs that countries have and then and trying to operationalise some of the research that's going on relating to remote sensing and ground-based data and the combination of those two data sources. Today though I'm just going to focus in on um, the, the first component which um, I'm the um, component manager for which is the methods and guidance um, development and um, most, most specifically the methods and guidance document that is published by the Global Forest Observations Initiative. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the UNFCCC has identified the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change guidance documents as the basis for all um, reporting or estimation and reporting requirement for UN, sorry, for Red Plus countries. Um, and these guidance documents were published prior to the, um, the work program, the Red Plus work program being finalised. The main two documents are the 2003 Good Practice Guidance for the land sector and the 2006 Guidelines, which is an update um, to those 2003 Good Practice Guidance. So the basis of these two methodological documents are that estimates should, ne should neither be over or underestimated as far as can be judged and that uncertainties need to be reduced as, as far as practicable. Um, these two documents specify in quite a lot of detail um, how to generate estimates for the forestry sector as well as other land, um, other land uses, um, but they're not specific to Red Plus. They're very much more specific to uh, national communication um, and greenhouse gas inventory um, development. So the Global Forest Observations Initiative identified this, uh, this current gap um, in, in the guidance and we've developed and published the methods and guidance document um, which was published in late 2013 uh, and this document specifically provides a link between the IPCC methods for greenhouse gas inventories and Red Plus activities which are slightly uh, different. Um, What's important is, is that uh, to, to note is that the MGD also uh, 
is consistent with those UNFCCC Warsaw framework and also the Paris Agreement um, where those um, decisions on Red Plus were, were um, agreed. And um, we also work very closely with a range of Red Plus agencies including UN Red, uh, the World Bank's Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, uh, the IPCC and uh, Gossi Gold uh, which also um, published the source book. That coordination is primarily um, coordinated through the Methods and Guidance Advisory Group uh, um, which are representatives from each of those um, organisations or groups uh, are, are represented on that um, advisory group. The MGD has approximately 45 to 50 active authors involved in its um, in the content that uh, uh, is presented in the MGD and we have a very extensive external review process very similar to the process of the IPCC uh, good practice guidance documents so it's uh, it's quite a rigorous process and can take some time to um, to complete the whole uh, development and publication process and I'm going to talk through some of the challenges and some of the um, ways we're trying to overcome um, those uh, that the time requirement um, and also provide uh, timely advice to countries in a very dynamic um, space. So the Global Forest Observations Initiative Methods and Guidance document aims to be relevant to all countries but as I've said it's basically intended for technical decision makers and policy colleagues in Red Plus countries as well as their partner and in international agencies including um, UN Red or um, the Forest Park, oh, sorry, the World Bank's FCPF program. Um, and also multilateral and bilateral programs. So we, we're trying to reach out to most um, most of the people who are trying to generate those emissions and removals estimates for Red Plus activities, recognizing that each of those programs or those relationships may have very different um, rules uh, or um, requirements around those as well and then also of course uh, meeting those UNFCCC requirements for MRV. Where, we've, where we, um, what, what the MGD does is it recognises that there's not one, one approach that's going to fit all countries and that comes down to a range of different challenges each of those countries are, are facing in terms of data availability, capacity um, and, and potential um, I guess finance from, um, from the uh, Red Plus program. So well, there's a number of um, requirements or a number of limitations or opportunities that countries have in front of them and the MGD tries to present a range of different scenarios, a range of different options that can fit um, different countries' um, situations. So um, as I mentioned, the MGD was published in uh, was late 2013-2014. Um, we now have it available in uh, English, French and Spanish um, and it's available through the Global Forest Observations Initiatives webpage. Um, I, I mentioned that Red Plus is quite dynamic and, and, and the requirement to utilise both remote sensing data and ground data um, and the rapid um, data availability especially in the satellite uh, remote sensing field with an, a number of new satellites and data from those satellites now available. Uh, we recognise that uh, it's a very dynamic field and so uh, this can be sometimes challenging to meet the, the, those um, developments and those advances in the research and the data availability through a long um, document development and review process. So the GFOI has worked together with its um, stakeholders and with uh, its partners to keep the methods and guidance document relevant and current by publishing a range of modules. So these modules go through a very similar um, process but they're targeted on a, on a particular aspect of MRV and to date we've published uh, three and a fourth is in progress. 
Uh, so the, the first one was uh, a clarification document around the relationship between the methods and guidance document and the Gofsey Gold source book, um, which I'll elaborate on um, shortly. Uh, the second one was a quite a, a useful a data, um, sorry, quite a useful module that communicated how to use uh, global data sets, in particular um, the work from the University of Maryland um, that is, forms the basis of Global Forest Watch. So how, how could countries make use of global data sets to um, fill some of those immediate data needs they have in the absence of their own national data? And the third one was in response to quite a lot of demand from uh, countries and also their, um, their partners or their supporting agencies uh, such as um, UN Red on how to establish forest reference levels or forest reference emissions levels, um, which I'll go, go into a little bit more detail um, shortly. And so that, that this uh, module built on the, the advice in the original version one of the MGD to present some more experiences from countries who had um, been developing those and, and submitting them um, for, for review. At the moment we're working on the second version, complete second version of the methods and guidance document. It, this new version is due late uh, 2016. We're actually in the process of now finalising our responses to the review comments, so we're very close to um, the final version of the text. Um, this new version builds on significant feedback from, from users and from the community and to incorporate uh, some more of those experiences of countries um, who have been working through the MRV um, framework and also new developments in technology and data availability. Uh, we, we took uh, the feedback from the user community and we've provided a lot more visual material such as flowcharts and decisions. Um, which we believe help in the decision making and the identification of the best um, approach based on country specific uh, situation. We've also strengthened the guidance on institutional arrangements, integration methods, statistical inference and uncertainties and this has been um, uh, in feedback to try and present a full framework of not just the MRV component but of the National Forest Monitoring System and the opportunities of, of developing a full system to, to, um, to report your Red Plus and other and utilise that system for other reporting requirements more broadly that the country may have. Um, we've integrated the module material, so uh, the three modules I mentioned previously, into this new MGD and, and even extended on those um, even more um, as we've recognised that um, the, the field is very dynamic in how countries are utilising information and, and having to progress very rapidly now into implementation of Red Plus. Um, and we've also incorporated a number of updates from the UNFCCC from the policy side, um, in particular in relation to the outcomes of the Paris Agreement uh, last year. And as I've said, of course, updates on satellite data availability. Where we've, you know, in a very exciting period where we've got such a lot of remote sensing um, data that's available now, and um, in some cases even free, free to countries. And so we're trying to make sure that countries are aware of how to, what data is available, and how to access that data as quickly as possible. So the GFI methods and guidance document basically provides a step-by-step -step, um, process or advice on the readily implementable approaches to Red Plus MRV. So what I mean by that is that the, the document presents um, a, an approach that is what we describe as operational approaches, meaning that if countries follow these um, this guidance that it's based on processes that have been already utilised in reporting of forest related emissions and removals. Um, so we, we, we tend to identify um, opportunities in the research and development that are moving towards an operational approach but we, we don't, um, well, we, we, we really just focus in on those operational approaches. So 
the 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 methods and guidance material is intended for technical decision makers and policy colleagues as well as their partners as I mentioned before and it is around operational approaches and opposed to the um, Goffsey Gold sourcebook which is an annual update um, or review of the science related to Red Plus MRV. So it presents a, a, a basically a, a where we are now with all of our technology, all of our um, research and development, and how that relates to um, reporting. And the um, methods and guidance document is focused on operational approaches. So they are very complementary, and uh, they're designed to be used together. Um, they reference each other quite well now um, and the countries should be looking at how they can utilise them um, both in, in combination to report their emissions and removals um, to the UNFCCC. Yep. So the MGD um, is basically broken down into um, five core components where we've identified an issue and uh, um, working on presenting a solution to those issues. So from the perspective of um, the science background, um, as I said, the, the Goffsey Gold source book uh, and annual update and the R&D component contribute to the GFOI to present um, that science background and the, the current status of that science. The MGD provides a, a bit of a, a, a summary of um, the policy context to help countries to understand how that all works together. And we, in the um, front chapters, we work through the UNFCCC decisions um, on um, the seven COP decisions. They cover the finance, support, NFM, the National Forest Monitoring System, safeguards, reference levels, measurement reporting and verification and the drivers of deforestation and degradation. And then, of course, the additional Paris decisions on safeguards, the non-carbon benefits, joint adaptation and mitigation. So the MGD presents this uh, a summary of, of all of these decisions and describes how countries can um, address these decisions in their MRV um, and the reporting, in particular, of their emissions and removals. Following on from the summary, uh, in the first uh, chapters of the MGD, we work through a methodological framework based on the IPCC Good Practice Guidance. And this methodological framework is a series of um, advice as well as uh, um, equations and um, detailed examples of how countries can work through and arrive at emissions and removals estimates. We are then also um, link that with uh, what presented as a methodological need, which is that link between the IPCC reporting of greenhouse gas inventory in, in the greenhouse gas inventory um, framework and translate that into the Red Plus activities framework. Um, and that we do that in a way that provides consistency with that good practice definition. Um, and I'll touch on what those good practice um, elements are in, in, in slides, um, in, in, in a couple of slides later on. This is, um, this link between the IPCC Good Practice Guidance and Red Plus activities is very important because uh, it's, it, at the moment it's not, uh, it's, the MGD is, is one of the um, only places where that link is, is, is actually made between those two, two elements, two reporting requirements. And then um, we work through a range of, oh, sorry, I'll just go back. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to work through uh, this methodological framework and methodological need, how the MGD um, presents that. And then I'm going to um, touch on the reporting and verification requirements in particular, the technical assessment and analysis. So we're just going to um, diverge here from the MGD strategy, and I'll go into a little more detail on the framework and the need. So the MGD presents the methodological framework in, in four core um, components. So the first one, these well, these four components are the 
core elements of a national forest monitoring system. So with these elements in place, then um, in a national forest monitoring system, then countries can um, more effectively meet the measurement reporting and verification requirements of the UNFCCC. So these four components are institutional arrangements, so making sure you've got the setups and the institutional arrangements of your national forest monitoring system in place, a range of policy and design decisions that need to be made, and we present these in the context of the decisions, but also in the context of the um, of the IPCC good practice guidance, so around design decisions around what data sources you need and how you're going to integrate those data sources together. Um, and then the third element is measurement and estimation. The measurement, measurement and estimation component is really where we get into the detail of the equations and how each component of your emissions and removals within the forest ecosystem are being um, being measured and estimated, what data, um, how, your, how you generate activity data from your um, remote sensing um, data, for example. And then the final element is um, reporting and verification. And we go here into quite some detail about how you generate your report, what information you need to have in that report, and the process by which you interact with the UNFCCC in the verification process. Each of these um, components, the, the four components there, have a range of subcomponents. And if you think about the top um, components, institutional arrangements, policy and design decisions, those being the first level headings, and then we have a range of different, um, go into more detail, second level headings in the document um, in, in these components underneath. So, for example, in policy and design decisions, you can see here we have a range of policy decisions, what, what is your forest definition, what act, red plus activities are you going to report, what carbon pools are the most significant and, how, and, and what data you have around those, what ones are you going to report, and then what m approaches, methods and um, tools are you going to use to generate your um, estimates, how do you do your, how are you going to present your estimates and your land use land cover stratification scheme, and what is the spatial and temporal scope at which you can report um, your Red Plus uh, activities. So you can see we go quite a low level of detail here and present um, decision trees and guidance about how you can make decisions around those aspects of your emissions and removals estimates. You may it, I put up this uh, decision tree here just as a as an example of how we present the uh, the information. So it, I know it's a little small, so I apologise for that. But of course you can see this uh, these decision trees and in, in the MGD document itself, which you can download um, from the GFY website, as I said. So this is an example of um, one of the decision trees that we present in the policy and design decision um, component of the MGD and this one in particular helps countries to decide what tier um, and tier is a IPCC um, methodological um, terminology that countries should report at. So for Red Plus reporting um, countries should be aiming for you know a tier 2 or tier 3 system um, and those tiers relate to whether, what national data you have available for particular activities. And so these decision trees help countries to identify what is the um, tier you should be aiming for and then there's additional decision trees about how you might make the pathway to actually get to that um, reporting level. Um, so um, we've really um, increased the number of decision trees in the second version, which, uh, as I said, will be available later in the year. Um, and we found that um, from feedback that um, it's these decision trees um, in support in support of the, uh, the some sometimes very technical text work well together to allow countries to make those pathways that they have available to them very much clearer and the decision making framework becomes a little less uh, um, a little 
less scary, if you like. We also um, present a range of um, examples, and this one um, is a, an example on uncertainty analysis when comparing your forest reference emissions level with your deforestation emissions. And you can see some of the um, equations in the uh, measurement and estimation component of the document become quite um, complex. And so to enable countries and users to be able to understand those, um, we pr provide a range of worked examples um, that are relevant to particular um, scenarios that countries might be facing. So then they, you can try and apply your own data into these, um, these worked examples so that the, the equations don't become too, um, too frightening. Then we also um, present a range of case studies um, from, from different countries that um, can put some of that advice and guidance in the MGD into context. Um, and this, this here's a, um, a case study from Kenya um, talking about how you can um, identify land use changes both with remote sensing data and auxiliary data that you might have um, relating to your ground, the actual activities that are going on on the ground. And in this case, it's around plantation management and the changes between how you distinguish between deforestation and forest management events, which is a common, um, a common situation in many REM plus countries. So with, with the combination of those three elements, the decision trees, the worked examples, and the case studies, we find this very um, useful support material to, some, to work through the sometimes heavy um, um, advice in, in the document um, and try and put those um, decision-making requirements, those estimation requirements in the context of Red Plus specifically, um, rather than in the broader greenhouse gas inventory context. And from feedback from countries, that's been very useful for, the, for them for, to actually make decisions and end up with estimates um, for their reporting requirements. So if we work back now to what those reporting requirements and verification requirements are, um, the MGD um, presents the technical assessment and analysis processes um, that are required by the UNFCCC and we, we present those in a, a systematic way of how, what, what countries are required to report, where they can get that information from and then the process by which they're going to um, uh, interact with the technical assessment or technical analysis team. So we'll just pause here for a minute and, and, and work through um, some of those requirements. Um, I've separated uh, the reporting requirements into the two, well, I, sorry, there's a, I've said three main groups, but I've actually um, just presented it in a more simplified form of two main groups. So there's uh, the two main groups I'm going to be referring to in the next couple of slides is the Annex 1 and, and, and non-Annex 1 parties. So when we refer to Annex 1 parties, um, just a reminder that they're um, basically include industrialised countries um, that were members of the OECD in 1992. Um, that's the definition of, of what an Annex 1 country is in the context of the UNFCCC. And then non-Annex 1 parties, and these are mostly developing countries, and the convention emphasises um, activities that promise to answer the special needs and concerns of vulnerable countries such as investment, insurance, and technology transfer. So each of these countries, Annex 1 and non-Annex 1, they have different reporting requirements. That's the message I'm trying to get across and I'm going to discuss those now. So those reporting requirements for Annex 1 countries are that um, to the United Nations, they need to submit national communications every four years and greenhouse gas inventories on an annual basis. And they also need to present biannual update reports and they're, they're um, every two years. And all of these um, reports and the inventory is subject to a review process. Uh, countries, un Annex 1 countries are under the Kyoto Protocol, which um, non-Annex 1 countries are not um, required to report under. 
um, they can voluntarily also submit a forest management reference level. So they're the reporting requirements of Annex, Annex 1. Non-Annex 1 countries are the countries we're talking about when we're talking about Red Plus activities, so only non-Annex 1 countries can participate in Red Plus. So their reporting requirements are national communications every four years and biennial update reports every two years. And then if, if non-NX1 non country voluntarily opts to report Red Plus, they then need to report a forest reference emissions level or a forest reference level. And just to remind people that this is voluntary and in the context of results-based payments for Red Plus. So the guide... So guidelines on um, requirements are detailed for Annex 1 countries and especially for greenhouse gas inventories and these are guidelines are detailed in the IPCC Good Practice Guidance documents that I previously mentioned. Um, but they're more generic for non-Annex 1 parties and this is where the MGD tries to be very much more specific about how countries, um, about presenting guidelines for non-Annex 1 parties for Red Plus reporting. So this, uh, this um, diagram uh, presents um, reporting and verification requirements for Red Plus. So if you look at it in columns rather than rows, so you've got the, the, the what needs to be um, reported. So if we look down, there's four core elements of Red Plus reporting, a national strategy or action plan, uh, a national forest reference emissions level or forest reference level, which is also um, in a stepwise approach um, you can you can also present that as um, in a subnational uh, sorry not a stepwise approach but you can also present as a um, a subnational frail as an interim measure uh, if you don't have enough data for example for your whole for the whole country um, then the green um, element is the results in tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year so they're the, you first submit a FREL, which is your baseline, and then you submit results against that FREL um, in subsequent years. And then information on safeguards. So there's four elements. And then there's, if we move to the next column, there's the UNFCCC channel. So um, this means the reporting requirement to the UNFCCC. So for the strategy and action plan, there's, there's no channel. Um, for the FREL, there's a submission. You have to submit the FREL to the UNFCCC um, and that's as a report. For your results, you submit those in your as a technical annex to your biennial update report and your safeguard information is submitted in your national communication. So that's every four years, as you, if you recall from the previous slide. Um, the next is the process. So for your for the top one, there's no further, further action required for your strategy and action plan. Your technical, your FREL is subject to a technical assessment process um, and that's in the context of results-based payments, the RBP. Once it's technically assessed, um, that you can move on then um, to, to your results, which is then also part, uh, subject to a technical, um, technical analysis process. Um, and your safeguards are, are not part of any assessment process. So you can see there that your national strategy and your action plan and your safeguards information aren't technically assessed or part of a technical assessment pro process, but anything result re related to emissions estimation or emissions removal estimation is subject to a UNFCCC assessment process. There's a, there's a, um, a column there on timing and we've touched on that. So the you, you submit your FREL when you're ready um, and then your results are every two years as part, assessed every two years as part of your submission of your biennial update report. And then safeguards, of course, as I said, national communication is every four years. Um, the information that you provide is um, submitted on the UN, I'm sorry, on the UNFCCC Red Plus platform. Um, it's amazing I always get that mixed up. I always... Uh, <laughs> hard to say that three times in a row. Um, and so uh, it's all publicly available, in particular your forest reference emissions level and your results. So at the moment you can, people can access the Red Plus platform and see and read the 
forest reference emissions levels that have been submitted by countries to date and of course the um, assessment reports by the technical assessment team. And then the last column is um, for those of you interested in the actual policy, there's a list of um, the decisions from the UNFCCC that specify those processes and um, need to be carried out. So that, that, that's basically the reporting and verification requirements um, for the for the Red Plus um, work program. So in, in terms of information that needs to be included in the FREL and um, the results report, there's two columns here and this, this uh, is from the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility Methodological Framework. They have a, a, a document that I recommend you have a look at as well. Um, it's also um, referred to by the MGD. Uh, and there's a number of methodological steps on the left and um, the data, maps or synthesised data that you need to, um, to basically meet those um, reporting requirements. So these methodological steps you'll see are consistent with those that I presented earlier in relation to the, how the MGD presents its uh, methodological framework. So of course uh, forest definition, your stratification or your forest classes, um, the activity data and the methods that you use, the choice of emissions factors and description of their development. So emission factors being related to how you um, multiply up well, how you take the activity on the ground, the activity data, and multiply that up to generate emissions and removals estimates. Because of course, as I said, those, the report needs to be in tons of carbon dioxide equivalents, um, not areas of change. So that's where the emission factor component comes in. Um, estimation, the estimation approaches that you use for um, generating those uh, emissions and removals estimates. So that comes down to your approaches, methods and tiers and related to that decision making tree that um, I presented. How, you, how countries present their accuracy, precision and the confidence level. So with each of these um, um, estimates you have to include a, a level of uncertainty. Um, it, 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 you need only report that. The UNFCCC doesn't require any specific um, level of accuracy or precision but um, you need to actually report what 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 um, level of accuracy and precision and the confidence level that you have in those estimates. Uh, you have to discuss those key uncertainties and then um, work through any rationale for adjusting those emissions and of course document the methods and assumptions um, that you might make. Um, in terms of maps and th synthesized data, um, you need to of course have the area that you're working in and in most cases this will be national and as an interim step you can also look at subnational areas but with the aim of reporting national. Um, your activity data which comes from your remote sensing generally, um, it also can come from an extensive NFI if, if you choose to um, take that approach um, and activity data reflects what's actually going on the ground, what changes are you seeing happening in your forest lands on the ground and what those changes uh, what, what, what land use that the forest land is changing to um, or from. Uh, the emissions factors, as I said, we, we, have, we have to document all of those, where they come from, um, how they've been generated and the confidence interval around those. Uh, the average annual emissions over the reference period. Now reference period comes um, from uh, in development of your FREL comes different programs will have different requirements. This, this for example, the World Bank program says somewhere between 10 and 15 years the reference period needs to be. So when you're developing up your reference level, you have to go back in time to look at um, your historical um, emissions to then project forward what your future emissions might look like. Um, different programs or different um, um, uh, partners may have different reference period requirements. Uh, that's not specified in the UNFCCC decisions. Um, and then any adjust, adjusted emissions needs to be reported um, and the spatial data used to adjust those emissions. So it's quite a good um, outline of the core requirements there of what the methodological steps are and what the data, um, actual data needs to look like. Uh, and again, um, this is detailed in a lot more detail in the, in the methods and guidance document. So 
I know um, in previous um, presentation by Martin Herald, we touched on the UNFCCC reporting principles, um, and those principles for Red Plus are um, transparency, completeness, accuracy, and consistency. And so, in terms of transparency, when you're when the reports are being submitted, the assessor is looking for um, communication around ensuring that all assumptions and the methods used in developing up the estimates are clearly explained and documented to the point that the assessor could um, verify its correctness. So, um, so it, the level of documentation needs to be quite high and the level of communication with the, um, with the assessment team or the technical assessment team um, needs to be at a point where they can actually verify the correctness of the, of the emissions and removals estimates. In terms of completeness, um, th that the estimates should include the all relevant geographical coverage, um, and that includes all agreed categories. So in this case, it would be all agreed red plus activities, all gases and all pools that have been agreed. Um, and, and how you come to agree those is related to whether or not they're um, key categories and then of course the available data that the country has to do that and then in the absence of available data for key categories then you look to um, have an improvement plan over time to enable you to bring um, those emissions estimates in at a national level. The third one, accuracy. Um, as I we touched on this before, that estimates need to be systematically neither over or underestimating the true value as far as can be judged, and that uncertainties reduce, are reduced as far as practicable, and that, that comes down to the availability of national data and the, also the cost of generating that national data. Uh, understanding your uncertainties is obviously the first step to um, reducing those, and um, most countries really at that stage of just getting a good handle on their uncertainty assessment and we've spent quite a lot of um, time and um, energy in the MGD to present processes and examples about how to achieve those uncertainty estimates. Um, consistency. So consistency here means that you use the same definitions and methodologies between different years. So as we said in the reporting requirements, you've got multiple years to report. The FRAL could be, the forest reference emissions level could be between 10 and 15 years. You need to, the, the, the way in which your estimates um, are generated needs to be consistent through time. So you're comparing, so the comparison between the years is, is consistent. In terms of how countries, uh, um, what challenges countries are facing in meeting these reporting principles. Here's a brief summary of some of the challenges that have been identified. So in terms of transparency and consistency, um, this can be achieved by most countries um, and generally after adequate capacity building um, is conducted if it's needed. But tr for transparency, consistency and comparability, um, it's, it's achievable by most countries at this stage and it just comes down to having really good documentation about your decision making um, and the data that you've used. In terms of completeness, um, based on official reports and, and this is the national communications from the UN or um, another good source of um, is the FAO's forest resource assessment, it seems that only a few countries are reporting on soil carbon for example um, and in some cases, following deforestation, this could be a significant um, emission source. And so, um, in terms of completeness, there could be some challenges there, of course, because measuring soil carbon is, is, um, is, not, is not always straightforward and can be quite costly as well. Uh, in terms of accuracy, um, so in the context of the IPCC, key categories and significant pools should be estimated, and higher tiers um, should be. Um, um, aimed for specifically around country specific data stratified by climate, forest, soil and conversion type and this should be done at a medium to fine spatial scale and this is presenting a big challenge for countries. So accuracy is probably the, the biggest um, challenge I guess in relation to reporting to the, um, uh, the IPCC principles. 
So I, I wanted to end up with um, just a quick uh, um, uh, example or a quick um, uh, discussion around a, another tool that the GFOI has um, developed basically um, acknowledging the fact that there's a, a range of different um, source and guiding material around to help you through Red Plus. Um, and then there's also, of course, a number of different programs and bilateral um, or um, multilateral um, uh, arrangements with different countries. And GFOI um, is working across all of these book, uh, all of these guidance materials and with all of these programs to try and present um, Red Plus in a more um, consolidated way. And we, we've taken um, the initiative um, with uh, financial support from the Australian Government to um, consolidate and coordinate all of this material in one location uh, and, and to um, present this in a way that countries can access that material in a much more um, systematic and contextualised way. And this is through a, a new online application called Red Compass, which was launched uh, a couple of months ago. It's available um, through the uh, URL um, just that's presented up, up here. And um, um, it presents uh, the material in the same um, framework as I mentioned earlier, the institutional arrangements, policy and design decisions, measurement estimation and reporting and verification. Um, so we collate all of the guidance and training materials uh, consistent with the MGD into one location and it presents it in a step-by-step -step approach um, through a series of actions. So countries are given a, an action list and they can work through each action and then be presented with the um, training or support tools to allow them to complete that action. Um, it provides access to the guidance, decision trees and training materials um, that relate to each of those actions and enables the users to mark them as completed or whether they need areas uh, and identify priority areas for training and, um, and, and then can communicate that to their colleagues or even to the GFOI if they choose. So um, you've seen this uh, slide before, that the four core components, the, um, the red compass presents then those second level headings in this uh, pyramid framework that encourages users to work from the bottom to the top. So you work um, basically from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid for each of these core um, components. And the idea is you work through um, from institutional arrangements from left to right, reporting and verification, and from the bottom to the top of each pyramid. And each of those pyramids has a range of actions. Um, and you can see some of them are, are more intense than, than others. Um, but as you work through the system, you can complete your MRV requirements. So the, the red compass gives you access, in this case we've gone into measurement and estimation and remote sensing observations for the purpose of this demonstration, it provides you direct access to the methods and guidance sections that are relevant to that um, component, our, our remote sensing observations. And you can also get this list of actions um, related to um, remote sensing observations and you can click them as um, um, have a, a state, so uh, here in this case this action is not done, and then we can click on show here and it will provide us with a range of different options of related resources and tools, so in this case we can get direct access to the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility training materials that Martin Herald had presented earlier in this, uh, in this webinar series. You can also get access to remote sensing um, tools that look at um, what data is available because that's what this um, action is relating to. So to consult remote sensing experts and identify the most efficient approach for um, developing activity data. So you could access some of the available GFOI tools and GFOI partner tools to, um, in this case, uh, select your most appropriate remote sensing data. You can list here whether or not you need training in that action. Um, and you can add a tag, in this case, um, further actions required because you obviously need some training. It's, you can't mark it as done because it, you, you obviously you need the training before you can do that. And then there's an ability to write a response here. So in this case, there's a bit more detail about 
for what training is actually required. Now you can use this to information to communicate within your own um, group, with your own colleagues to then establish um, and meet, uh, create some, a training program to meet this requirement or you can also communicate that to GFOI um, if, you, if you're a part of the GFOI countries to, um, to access training um, through, through that framework. It presents a much more systematic way for countries to track their progress on the MRV and then also to identify their needs against their methods and guidance document where they need more support and then um, seek help in those areas. We, the the app application um, records all of this information and allows you to generate reports about um, how many actions you've um, completed um, and within which um, component of your MIV system they've been completed and then of course any training requirements you've identified um, and then you can act on those um, training requirements. So uh, I've come to the end of the presentation I'd like to just summarize now. Um, the main points I want to reiterate are that the uh, Red Plus MRV um, is a voluntary um, process, so countries opt in to reporting their Red Plus um, activities. They, countries need to use a combination of remote sensing and ground data, um, and that IPCC methods and approaches um, should be applied in um, generating those estimates from remote sensing and ground data. The Global Forest Observations Initiative Methods and Guidance document provides a step-by-step -step, um, approach and advice on readily implementable approaches. So that's operational approaches for Red Plus MRV and those approaches are based on remote sensing and ground-based data integration. And um, finally, that Red Compass has been developed um, in response to countries' um, feedback and to provide a, a systematic um, development framework within which they can access the core um, methods and guidance material, training and tools that allow them to complete the, the different actions required to actually generate estimates and then work through the MRV process of Red Plus. I would like to encourage you to visit um, Red Compass where you can access not only the framework, the operational working framework, but also of course the methods and guidance document and all of the GFOI related resources and tools that have been developed over the last few years to support countries in their MRV um, um, aspirations. And um, finally to acknowledge all of the GFOI um, leads and partners, in particular uh, the Australian Government, the Government of Norway, um, the Silver Cup Program of the US, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO of the United Nations, and CEOS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. Of course, the MGD Advisory Group, authors and reviewers, who many volunteer their time to um, complete the, the document, so many thanks to them and all of the other um, governments and agencies who support um, participation of countries in the GFI um, initiative. All right, so at this point I will play our second recording from our guest speaker, Henrik Fleeflet. Everyone, my name is Henrik Fleeflet. I work in the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment in the International Climate and Forest Initiative which is one of the few major donors in the uh, Red Plus sphere. I'll get back to that uh, later on. And I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, eager to provide a few of the uh, overarching policy perspectives on forest monitoring and the role of uh, MRV, uh, of forest area change particularly, and the role that remote sensing can have in this. I'm not a technical expert and I won't be speaking much on the particularities of certain tools or approaches, but rather give a bit of an insight on current policy developments, how we deal with reporting of 
forest area change and change in emissions from forest areas in our partnerships with tropical forest countries and the role that carbon markets were thought to have and may have in the future in this framework. My presentation builds on the first week's presentation by Professor Martin Harold. As I saw, he gave you all a thorough introduction into the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, the decisions that have been made there for the framework to reduce emissions from deforestation, degradation, and enhance the sequestration of carbon through sustainable forest management, the REDD plus or RED plus framework. Um, and I heard that he also introduced you to the guidance the IPC sets for how countries should report and operate uh, within Red Plus. And by countries, I mean here both tropical forest countries that are meant to reduce deforestation and emissions, and donor countries that pay and reward uh, those reductions. So, kicking off right on the bat. Um, you can see the outline of the presentation yourself. I first want to set the frame a bit about where we have gotten in the Red Plus world since the negotiations began, since they were set last December in Paris, and the areas in which Red is made hmm, cutting edge, as you might call it, where the actual practical implementations of making it operational are, are made. I'll speak a bit about um, common requirements for reporting red results and the role of remote sensing in this, the uh, independent verification of results, and as I mentioned, the role of the carbon markets. Hopefully, by the end of the session, uh, you'll all have an increased understanding of uh, the most recent developments um, and uh, at least the perspectives of one of the donors on uh, where RED is and where RED is going. So without further ado, I'll fire away. I mentioned that I work in NICFI, the International Climate and Forest Initiative. This was originally established way back in 2007 at the Climate Change Convention, the Conference of the Parties in Bali, in Indonesia, recognizing the large amount of greenhouse gas emissions that stem from land use change and the loss of particularly tropical forests and the mitigation potential that lies in increasing forest cover, increasing the sequestration of carbon. Uh, recent estimates I've seen based on the most recent IPCC report um, estimate that reducing tropical deforestation and increasing restoration of forests can contribute as much as, as a third of the mitigation that is necessary to reach the two degree targets and limit global warming to uh, below two degrees, as was also agreed in uh, Paris in December, where nearly 200 countries have all finally pledged that this is our shared goal. Um, I keep referring to the Paris Agreement, and in a sense, this ties straight into my point, second point about the goals of NICFI, where one of our key goals was to get engaged in the negotiations and even uh, make sure that there was such a framework for being able to reward countries for reduced emissions from the forest sector to establish RED. And RED is very much established. This goal has been met. The negotiations are completed. The framework is done. And the Paris Agreement that nearly 200 countries all signed on to last December specifically references RED+. Plus. So, it's here, it's here to stay, we're set. Um, the total envelope of NICFI is currently about 500 million US dollars annually, specifically first and foremost for result-based payments, payments for performance. The logic is tantalizingly simple. If a country can document that they have reduced deforestation, they will be rewarded for that reduction. Uh, based on converting the reduction deforestation into a certain amount of tons of CO2 equivalents and paying for those tons. Norway does not purchase tons of CO2. 
Norway does not purchase tons of CO2 for use in an offset mechanism to compensate for our own emissions. This is a pure a good for the global climate reward mechanism. If you reduce emissions, if you reduce deforestation, you will be rewarded. That's the whole that's the whole structure. Now, if you just put up this big bag of money at the end and ask countries to get there, some will be able to do it, but given the very wide and varied nature of developing countries all over the world from in, in the tropical sphere, from middle income countries to least developed countries, their starting points couldn't be more varied, and the actual actions that need to be taken to reduce deforestation are as varied as the world can be. Therefore, some of our funding has also been provided for readiness efforts, for getting countries ready to participate in Red Plus, for ensuring that they can deliver the four, excuse me, <coughs> the four requirements of uh, Red Plus. A system to report on safeguards, to ensure that when you're trying to combat deforestation, you're not just establishing um, climate plantations, you're not removing natural forests and putting in rapidly uh, growing eucalyptus plantations to thereby generate carbon credits, safeguards against those kind of things, safeguards against the uh, exclusion of indigenous peoples from their traditional lands uh, for, for climate reasons, for example. So having safeguards in properly implemented is one of the requirements. Uh, another of the requirements is a national strategy for how Red Plus will be implemented, how deforestation will be reduced, and how this is a part of the sustainable development pathway of, of the country. And the key requirement for this presentation is the requirement of being able to measure, report, and verify your reduction in deforestation and your reduction in emissions. In order to do so, you need to have an uh, established and functioning National Forest Monitoring System, NFMS, as I point out in this, uh, in, in this presentation. Therefore, since 2007, Norway and uh, other donors have come along uh, afterwards, have supported bilateral agreements directly with tropical countries and multilateral uh, institutions such as the United Nations program on RED, and the World Bank Carbon Funds, the FCPF Carbon Fund, and the BioCarbon Fund. I mentioned them here, and I have a link to both the Carbon Fund and the BioCarbon Fund up on, uh, on the presentation below. I encourage you all to take a, uh, to take a look. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I've picked up a bit of a cold recently, so I'll have to apologize, I'll have to apologize for my voice. But through the readiness support that we've been provided, we've also then provided uh, support for improving and establishing and improving national forest monitoring systems in each country. Even though we're paying for reductions in carbon uh, emissions or CO2 emissions, Norway is not going to perform its own global uh, monitoring of how countries are performing. This is a national-led effort in each individual country and the individual country's own sovereign monitoring systems are the ones that are ultimately used as a basis for payments. That said, they still need to confirm or to, to uh, adhere to the decisions that have been made in the Climate Convention. And I'll get back to that when I come in on the reporting point. We've been supporting readiness efforts all over the world in total in as much as 60 countries. But so far, only three countries have, by this year, 2016, made it to the operational phase three of Red Plus, where they receive payments for funds for reduced emissions on an annual basis. That is Brazil, Guyana, and Colombia. Brazil and Guyana have had bilateral agreements with Norway for five years, um, and Colombia just entered into an agreement with Norway, the UK, and Germany last year, and I've received their first payment only one month ago. So it's moving, moving forward slowly, but countries are getting there, and in some areas the technical limitations, the ability of monitoring change and reporting on change in deforestation trends is the real bottleneck to, uh, to implementation. I'll 
move on and uh, give a little bit more of the background of why Red Plus even exists. Um, it's easy to it, it's easy for the talk to stray when I get into this uh, topic, but it, in case the audience is not familiar, a little bit of a of a uh, history lesson. Um, the key underlying problem here is that forests are a public good in their climate effect, sequestration and storage of carbon, in their ecosystem services, uh, for prevention of soil erosion, for water filtration, as a host of uh, biodiversity necessary for pollination. There is a suite of services that forests provide for the world that are mostly a public good. However, the profits or the, the, the profit that can, can be turned from forests is usually taken in private hands. Deforestation, uh, the extraction of timber, the establishment of uh, agricultural practices on previously forested land is immediately seen as a private benefit. So there's an underlying failure in how we value forests and trees. As I put it out so nicely, trees used to be worth more dead than alive. Uh, Back in 2007, the vision was that the Red Plus framework that the countries would agree to that would all come to a head in the Conference of the Parties and the Climate Convention in Copenhagen would settle the issue once and for all and would provide a true valuation of forests. There was expectation of massive financing to correct the ruling paradigm, but this never came. And in today's world, it's still not likely. Additionally, the, the, I, it needs to be emphasized that the, the funding that is currently moved through Red Plus, I mentioned 500 million US dollars at the, at, the, at the start from Norway and other donors provide just as much. This is a lot of money if you're coming at this from an environmentalist perspective, as I'll admit uh, I am. Uh, if you're used to working on conservation projects, it automatically seems like a lot of money. This is because it comes from the development uh, agenda. In the development agenda, it's medium. It's not bad. It's not huge. It's not small. It's somewhere in the middle. And compared to the economic forces of the underlying drivers of deforestation, it's still small. So where we are now, uh, in the absence of massive large-scale finance that provides a true valuation of forests, we are now in a world where red is an additional incentive on top of countries' own efforts and own incentives in preserving forests. Given the value, given the public goods that forests provide, it is in countries' own interests and in the world's interest to reduce deforestation. And the carbon finance is just one of many incentives that comes on the top. It is a source of key strategic financing and political support, attention and momentum that is meant to aid the transition of countries to a more sustainable and forest-friendly economy uh, to help countries onto a green development pathway rather than following the mistakes made of, of past development and assuming that deforestation is necessary for development. Breaking out of that cycle and moving to a place where you can have economic growth and development and still preserve your forest. This requires considerable own effort from forest countries. So the efforts have to ultimately pay for themselves rather than any effort that relies on red payment by itself is will not, not be sufficient. Now that was a bit of a, almost a bit of a tangent, but this is, to me, this is a key understanding of how carbon finance comes in as a, at the top and not as the core incentive. I keep saying incentive because uh, I want to emphasize again that the Red Plus rules that have been negotiated are negotiated in order to build up a reliable and robust incentive mechanism. This is not necessarily the same as an accounting system. The accounting system is already there to account for countries' various commitments in the climate change agenda. But what we have in Red Plus is a framework that enables donor countries to reward the transformational change that is necessary in developing countries. And this framework has been endorsed by the Paris Agreement and is here to stay, at least 
until 2030. I believe I've touched on a couple of these topics already as it's easy for the slides to drift in and uh, on each other. I mentioned that red finance is actually small in comparison to the key drivers of deforestation, the agricultural commodities that I've uh, listed here. So I've already covered this. I'll just move on. All right. Now, the work that we're doing is long term because it is development aid. It is about a green development pathway for the country. But the need to reduce emissions in the short term is incredibly urgent. If we're going to, as a well, as a global community, keep emissions below uh, the threshold necessary to reach our two degree target, we need to reduce deforestation and we need to increase sequestration as soon as possible. The uh, solution to the varied systems in countries that I already mentioned, that all the countries starting at different levels uh, and progressing at different speeds, has been an acceptance inside the Red Rules for a phased approach on stepwise improvement. I believe the first presentation by Harold already covered the phases of RED, moving from a readiness phase to a transitional phase to an operational phase in which there are pure pavements for performance. Stepwise improvement means that as donors who pay for results, we accept the fact that you start, you can start at a very simple basic level with whatever is possible to produce in a short term and improve over time. And this is especially true for national forest monitoring systems and for the reporting of results. As donors, we have a high um, acceptance of poor data, um, high uncertainty, simplifications and the like, as long as those as long as we have insight into the underlying assumptions, as long as we have an idea of just how large the uncertainty is, then you can deal with it. Then you can build and negotiate particular uh, rules and regulations that will, that will deal with it. But you need the underlying information. Now, this, I put up a bit of a provocative sentence in the presentation here uh, because I wanted to try to get a, a point a point across and how we work with uh, with this in our countries most of the time you know there are imperfect systems with imperfect information and this is can be difficult to do in um, what should you say inventories versus um, reporting in an incentive system the incentive system is supposed to be reliable and consistent and reward those actions that will ultimately lead to reduce deforestation. The inventory will just seek, it will just have, it's easier said than done, will seek a complete overview of what the atmosphere actually experiences. I put this up this provocative sentence just to give you the understanding that these two are not necessarily always the same thing. They don't always see eye to eye or, or the what the atmosphere experiences is ultimately what is most relevant. But when you're building a system that's supposed to incentivize change, you may be more, yeah, I say, pragmatic or flexible on the few key issues, as long as you know that you're getting uh, the right actions underway. Uh, a concrete example that I will mention here, uh, I put up these three topics from inventory rules by the IPCC uh, as, a, as examples of where you can re reach this tension. Um, an example will be uh, Norway and Brazil have had a bilateral agreement for payment for uh, emission reductions since 2008. This covers the Amazonas uh, biome in uh, Brazil and payments are based on reduced deforestation only. No, no other actions are, are, are considered. The amount of emissions that result from the reported deforestation is under 
estimated. We, for simplicity's sake, uh, the agreement stipulates that we assume a average carbon density of about 132 tons carbon per hectare across the entire Amazon, which in reality is probably close to half or a third even of what is really the case for the carbon stock that is there of above ground biomass. Nevertheless, it is assumed that the uh, carbon stock is lower in the, reward, in the incentive system because this gives confidence in uh, the payments that are produced. Given the high uncertainty in trying to report annual forest cover changes, we accept that there is high uncertainty, and therefore, in a sense, Brazil only receives credit for about a third of what it really does, and it accepts this. For Norway, this provides confidence, because if you pay, well, to put it simply, if you pay them, you're probably getting two or three. You know that the risk of underpayment is, or the, the, the likelihood of underpayment is massively larger than the likelihood of overpayment. And this, this can perhaps seem a bit uh, trivial to, to, to some of you, but I just want to illustrate that there can be a difference between a uh, perfectly functioning greenhouse gas inventory and the uh, make do temporary and stepwisely improved frameworks for incentives for payment for performance. The uh, precise rules of these uh, payment for performance systems are made within the framework set by the Red Plus decisions and formalized in bilateral agreements between the donor country and the tropical forest countries, be they several donor countries together, as is the case in Colombia, or directly, as is the case with Norway and Guyana, or in multilateral agreements, as is the case with the World Bank FCPF Carbon Fund, or every donor uh, together uh, with the red countries and with observers from NGOs negotiated a methodological framework that spells out all the precise requirements, including requirements for MRV and national forest monitoring systems that were necessary to unlock finance. Now, MRV and National Forest Monitoring Systems receive a lot of attention, not only because they're usually what stands between a, a country and payment, but because of the logic that if you cannot measure something, you cannot manage it. Manage it. it is necessary both for unlocking result-based finance based on carbon, but also for influencing and giving information, and so informing a national policies that are meant to actually reduce deforestation and enhance sequestration. If you want to combat illegal logging, it is handy to have an idea of the scope of the problem and where it is occurring. It gives in, the National Forest Monitoring System gives the necessary information about which policies are necessary. So uh, this is a, one of the reasons why MRV receives a lot of attention. The other is, is almost more psychological, I would say that uh, numbers are assumed to be easy to understand, uh, and it is very appealing to look at something where, like the MRV area, where you can see concrete results. We uh, did not have a good overview of the forest. Now we have a more accurate estimate of forest area and forest area change than we did a couple of years ago. Easy to see progress. In order to unlock finance from Norway and other donors, um, it's necessary to report the emission reductions, as I mentioned, with a sufficient level of detail as specified by the Red Plus decisions and whatever additional modalities are set in each agreement. In addition, all reports must undergo independent verification. And I'll get back to the verification, as I mentioned later in the presentation. But suffice it to say, this is a fairly sensitive topic Anyone who comes at this from an academic angle might, might react and, and think, well, it's only good to get, to get reviews of what you're doing. Yes, but this is automatically tied into national sovereignty issues. It is a sensitive topic to give anyone who is an, uh, hmm, let's say, outsider insight into how you do things in your country. And this is true across all sectors of, of, of the climate convention 
and it is a much more broad topic than just red plus. Oh, yeah. Lastly, I would like to emphasize that, uh, as I did going into this, that the National Forest Monitoring Systems and the support that we provide for this and the expectation that we have for them is, of course, for systems that can, as I said, also uh, monitor carbon emissions. But ultimately, this is a question of improved resource management and development in each particular country. The, uh, I encourage you all, when you think about how are we going to measure carbon, to rather think about how are we going to build good systems of resource management that can also measure carbon. So that was a bit of a background, and I've touched in on a several of the topics in the rest of the presentation already. But I'll jump straight into reporting and Norway's experiences with uh, reporting um, as we've made in over the past seven years before I move on to the other, other uh, topics. The first question that comes up is, is not the UNFCCC or isn't the Climate Convention uh, sufficient? Yes, there is a UNFCCC uh, structure under this, as you've been, been, been informed. There is biannual update reporting. There are national communications. There are updates on, there is accounting on the commitments that countries have made. And there's a report on the inventories to provide information on what is really happening to the atmosphere, to inform climate models and all the rest. The decisions that have been made on Red Plus specifically give instructions on uh, how to set your reference levels how uh, to report uh, emission reductions, for example. But they only provide the framework. They provide the outer outer shell. Within that, there is a need for additional specification because, to speak quite frankly, all the negotiated text has been made by negotiators who are very good at negotiating uh, <laughs> and who have all made text that ultimately all countries could sign up for. But when it comes to operationalizing this and putting it into practice, it turns out that some more specification is necessary. I also want to point out, as I put up here, I said that there's no guidance on the level of ambition. This is a general topic within Red Plus and within the Climate Convention. Red Plus is a global agenda, yes, but certain countries are taking the lead because certain countries show that they have an actual ambition to reduce deforestation and set themselves on a sustainable development pathway and they wish us to have assistance or they want to be rewarded for that. There are other countries who do not have this ambition but who are still following the Red Plus rules and in a world of limited finance and limited attention it's easy to imagine that they will not receive um, attention and finance that they may expect if there is not also an underlying ambition. And the Convention's decisions, of course, do not provide any guidance on whether you should be ambitious in your plans or not. That would, that would be very difficult to make countries agree if this was, uh, if this was the case. Um, oh yeah, excuse me. So the UNFCCC sets the framework. The direct agreements between countries or between institutions such as the World Bank and countries set the reporting requirements with additional specifications or specific provisions beyond the red decisions uh, and they provide the basis for reporting of emission reductions reports which are then delivered directly to to the donors but which of course have to be consistent which were that with whatever natural re national reports are provided to the UNFCCC. oh yeah excuse me oh. Um, Norway, for its own part, subscribes to the IPCC principles of comparable and consistent and accurate and complete uh, information. And in addition, we also value any approaches that are cost efficient um, because we, <laughs> well, for obvious reasons, there is a limited amount of finance and we want to have be able to reward as many uh, countries as possible. Oh, yeah. The policy that we apply, we try to apply consistently across all the countries we support and in the multilateral channels. 
building on the guidance for greenhouse gas inventories already provided by the IPCC, in addition to several other uh, valuable sources of international guidance. And I've lifted, listed a couple in the presentation up above, and I encourage you all to visit particularly the websites for the Global Forest Observation Initiative and the Gotsi Gold, as it's called. Um, oh, yeah. The, both of these um, international cooperation organizations, if you like, have provided concrete guidance on how you can translate the Red Plus decisions into implementation in country that is IPCC compliant. It sounds obvious that this should be done by the decisions, but as, as I mentioned, there is a kind of a missing gap in between. And the Gossi Gold source book and the GeoFOI methods and guidance documentation provide that, that missing link. In addition, I mentioned already the uh, FCPS methodological framework for the Carbon Fund, where Norway was one of the several donors that negotiated this framework uh, back when it was settled in 2013. Some examples, of, or the key example I would give of additional specifications of specific provisions and all these terms I've been mentioning before that go above and beyond uh, UNIFCCC reporting. In line with NICFI's mandate from our Norwegian Parliament, we are rewarding emissions in reduction, emi uh, <laughs> rewarding reductions in emissions beyond anything else, and first and foremost, reductions from deforestation. One of the specific provisions that Norway can require in bilateral agreements with our countries can be a focus on gross deforestation or reducing emissions from gross deforestation over uh, any other indicators in our agreements. For example, um, a country may wish to increase uh, carbon stocks by increasing forest restoration uh, and be rewarded for this, and that's fair, but donors may have specific demands, and in Norway's case, this is specifically uh, an emphasis on gross deforestation, making sure that the loss of intact rainforest goes down. And this also has consequences, of course, for the MRV, National Forest Monitoring Systems, and what we demand technical solutions for remote sensing. Let's see. There we, oh, there we go. Uh, one of our principles that we try to apply in all our partnerships is that the reporting cycles and the reports that are given to Norway then undergo international verification, which gives important feedback that will help improve future monitoring. So this is a part of the stepwise process of gradual improvements. I put up this diagram just to illustrate the fact that the measurement of red results, the MRV, is only one component within the National Forest Monitoring System, as mentioned. And the reporting to a donor should be consistent with any commitments to the UNFCCC and accounting of these and the biannual update reports, for example but that there, goes, that there at the same time is a specific report to the donor that then undergoes independent international verification. Some of the issues that we have encountered in uh, the countries where we've been operating has been uh, that I, I, I thought I would mention a few that have the consequences for uh, national forest monitoring systems. And usually the agreements that we enter into then have specific uh, text that we have negotiated with the other with the tropical countries on these topics, such as how often you should uh, you should report. Um, this is a hot topic for anyone who knows anything about uh, tracking forests. Because of the idea of annual payments, there is a logic of annual reports. However, I should specify that that is a then a logic for annual reporting of change in forest area, or a change in forest area change, even. That is not the same as a requirement of having a full mapping of forest resources every year, which would be nothing close of ludicrous. Another key principle that we try to uh, follow across uh, all the reporting requirements is the requirement of public access and transparency. If you share something on the internet, all the way down to sharing the underlying data and the uh, methods uh, that you've been applying, everything's easier. 
so this is something that we try to to follow in all our all our agreements. Um, actually, the, and the, these two slides, I encourage you to look into the specific agreements that I'm going to link to later and look for how we have dealt with uh, dealt with these specific uh, these specific issues in the reporting. I wanted to mention the role of remote sensing um, and the requirements of MRV that we've encountered so far in reporting. And this is moving on too quickly now because I realize I'm taking too much time. But we've experienced that, uh, of course, there is a need for methodological improvements in how to monitor changes in forest degradation and specifically how to monitor enhancement of carbon stock and restoration of forests in a short time scale. Is it feasible to really get to a stage where we can measure a re-greening of a landscape in a five-year period, for example? The, this is the kind of, uh, of, of um, things that need to be worked out in some of our bilateral agreements. There is also a need for reference data. In some countries, there are excellent uh, forest inventories. In others, there is not. And I know that there is some ongoing work um, with providing uh, high-resolution satellite imagery uh, and permanent sampling plots for reference data in order to better use uh, remote sensing for tracking forest area change. And this is another area where uh, we would definitely see a need in, in several of our countries. In addition, as I mentioned uh, initially, one of our Achilles heels is not knowing enough about underlying uh, biases and uh, the level of uncertainty in the forest area change estimates that we are provided and that form the basis for results-based payments. In many cases, we know they are uncertain, but we don't know how uncertain. And if you know, have an indication of how uncertain, you can deal with it. If you don't, it's very difficult. This, I believe, I have already covered the relevance of natural forest monitoring beyond pure carbon. Uh, there is any number of application of forest monitoring and remote sensing that will support the programs that will actually reduce emissions. The, most, so far, we've just been talking mostly about the incentive mechanism that rewards the change when it has occurred. But in order to achieve that change, a number of programs will be uh, need to be implemented in many of them benefit greatly from remote sensing tools. Key example is uh, Brazil that reduced deforestation by more than 70%. First and foremost, by command and control uh, measures, by linking a early warning system for forest cover change directly with the environmental enforcement authorities and the federal police, so that the moment a uh, alert would pop up and be verified, out go the helicopters. Since I'm running out of time, I'll move on to a much more sensitive topic, uh, which I'll skim through and then go on to the carbon markets. I already mentioned that donors have a need, of course, for uh, having confidence in the use of public financing for Red Plus results. And this is what international verification is there to do. And under the UNFCCC negotiations in the convention, in the Red Plus decisions, countries have agreed to international verification. Specifying here, of course, that verification is not validation. The verifiers walk a very fine line because they do not go into the country and do their own analysis and compare this to what the country has had. It is much more comparable to uh, business assurance and, and certification uh, schemes that, that you may be familiar with from, from other sectors. You simply wish to investigate the methods are applied correctly and whether the results that have been presented to you are reconstructable. Additionally, we usually task our verifiers with providing recommendations for future improvements because if you repeat the cycle of reporting, getting input from world-leading experts on areas of improvement and finding potential errors, you will improve your reporting from year to year. I am going to get back to a concrete example of, of this as well. Uh, I already mentioned that countries have already agreed to international verification, but this is, make no mistake, a very controversial topic for most countries. So selling it in as an option for improvement 
is very much uh, welcome and has been our, in our experience been the most useful uh, approach. Just letting you all know uh, that this is an ongoing topic of uh, tense negotiations in every particular agreement we enter into. And while some countries may defer to the UNFCCC's Secretariat's own international consultation and analysis process as a method of verification, this in of itself is not verification and is not sufficient for donor needs uh, because it is not a true verification of the methods that have been applied, but a facilitative and non-intrusive comment on the results that countries can choose to respond to as they wish. So some country examples before I move into the uh, future carbon markets. I encourage you all to look up this more uh, online uh, by yourself and see how this, uh, the red decisions have been put into practice. One good example is the Norwegian-Guyana bilateral partnership where the Guyana Forestry Commission reports results directly to Norway on an annual basis and this is verified by an independent company uh, that, was in a, that was put out on an international tender. This was not easy. The first year of verification was a, a political mess, you could almost call it. But with every iteration, it gets better, trust is established, and the system is gradually improved. And Guyana is a real success story of a country that has gone from not even having mapped its borders properly to having a fully functioning, high quality, uh, in red terms at least, uh, system for monitoring forest cover change. I also want to draw your attention to the uh, uh, two agreements between Colombia and other donors, one on the national level and one in the Amazon biome under the Red Early Movers program, which is run by, by Germany. Here, Germany, the United Kingdom and Norway have all put in money for payment for performance or reduced deforestation in the Amazon and over time at the national level. And the agreements that have been made in Colombia include specific provisions for reporting and verification, and I encourage you all to look them up. Lastly, familiarize yourself, please, with the methodological framework under the Carbon Fund, which to me is really where many of the key methodological issues for how to report on change and how to, in a fair way, provide results-based payments, where they, they come to a head. Because the decisions were hard enough to make, but operationalizing them, this is, where, this is where it's done. So if you want to see the exact uh, modalities that have been decided, look that up. I don't know exactly how much time I have left now, but I'll run through the carbon markets a bit. And here I have to speak honestly, of course, on basis of uh, my position in a public program in Norway, on the basis of the mandate that we have of reducing emissions in uh, the short term. Markets where, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, markets were thought, as I mentioned in my introduction, to be a major part of the solution, but with the carbon markets crashing uh, and the absence of major uh, funding, this, this has just not uh, been the case. So it is still an open question whether uh, market mechanisms will really be. Uh, a useful tool to deliver on, on, the climate, uh, on the climate goals. This can ultimately almost boil down to a philosophical argument of whether you believe in private sector solutions or not, so I won't go into that at all, but leave you all to make your own, uh, make your own answers. But suffice it to say, it is an, uh, another issue uh, of uh, intense debate. There is, however, a continual expectation across the board from countries, from the individual projects that are implemented at reducing deforestation from red donors and from the private sector itself, that future carbon markets where you trade the emission reductions in tons of CO2 are going to be part of the solution because development aid and the international finance in the current model that also Norway operates at, uh, under is, well, we all, have a, we all have a window, we all have a specific uh, life, uh, life, shelf life, you could call it. And at some point, this will go away and uh, move to other areas. All right, everyone. So thanks again for joining us. And um, thanks for those who have stayed on for this long session today. Um, here's our contact information one last time. If you have any further questions, you can email myself, 
Cindy Schmidt or Jenny Hewson, our partner with Silver Carbon. If you have general inquiries about RSET, you can email Anna Pretos, and the RSET website is listed here. So we thank you for your participation, and I wanted to remind everyone that you can view all the recordings uh, from this webinar online, and if you are interested in that certificate of completion, um, please make sure you submit your homework too by July 14th, and we will be sending a email receipt of completion of the homework after that deadline, along with the homework answer key, as we did with homework one, and you should be receiving your certificates of completion about in about three months, so keep a lookout for those as well. Thank you all again, and um, have a good day.